All right, good evening. Take your Bibles with me. Turn to Job chapter number one. Job chapter number one. Um, you know, I'm preaching through uh, the stories of the Bible. I have a list. It comes from a book called All the Stories of the Bible, and I'm just following that list in their order. And what was on tonight was Job's three friends. Now, in this list, um, it basically just has a name for the story and uh, the passage. And some stories, you know, they span three or four chapters. And that's kind of difficult to preach on a Wednesday night, you know, one story out of three or four chapters. Um, But this story, this story spans the whole book of Job. And if you know anything about the book of Job, it is not a small book. It is 41 chapters in this book. So I'm going to preach 41 chapters tonight of the Bible. Um, We're not going to read all of that, of course. We can't. We're just going to get the shape of the story, and uh, we'll look at various passages as we go through it. Job chapter 1. Is everybody there? All right, let's read the first five verses. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one on his day, and sent and called for three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. And Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. All right, so the story introduces the main character, and this is this man named Job. And Job was probably a contemporary of Abraham. Um, he lived about that time. So this is after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, but before everything else. This is, chronologically speaking, this story takes place somewhere in the middle of the book of Genesis. And we got to understand a couple things about Job. Job is not a Jew. Uh, Job is not a Hebrew. There were no Jews. There's no mention of Israel in this book. He wouldn't have been born yet. Okay? He is not a Hebrew, but he is a believer. And there were believers... Uh, outside of Israel, there were believers that we find from time to time in the Bible, men like Melchizedek and, and others, okay? And in our introduction, it tells us about this man. It tells them he is a righteous man. It says he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And so he's a righteous, uh, he's a righteous dude, right? He's, he's a righteous man. And he's also extremely prosperous. He has 10 grown children, seven sons, and three daughters. Um, And interestingly, they don't hate each other because it says that uh, they each get together regularly for parties. So he's a blessed man. And his blessing extends to material things. He has a lot of sheep and castle, ca- camels and oxen and servants. In fact, it says he was the richest man in the East the greatest man in the East, but he's righteous. Um, It's his habit, it says, to wake up early in the morning and to make offerings for his children all the time. He's a righteous man. And at this point in the story, it's just sweet. You know, it's just like, it's idyllic. It's like a a perfect cloudless day. Uh, Job Job is already living at this point and is happily ever after, right? But then verse six comes. Look at it. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. So here the the scene shifts from Job to heaven. And God is interviewing the sons of God. It's probably the angels. And Satan is one of them. And even though Satan has fallen, he still answers to God. He's still under God's ultimate control. And God says to Satan, basically, what are you up to? And Satan says, well, I've been walking around the earth. And God says, well, you know what? You need to check out this guy, Job, my servant Job. There's not a man in all the earth that's as righteous as Job is. And Satan says, well, really, he is righteous, but he's not exactly doing it for nothing. Um, He has a pretty good deal. You've blessed him. You're protecting him. 
Uh, but you see, God, if you take that away, Job is going to curse you to your face. And so God says, okay, you can have him. Have at it. And now you know what happens next, right? You know the story. It says the Sabians, verse 15, come and steal his oxen and kill his servants. Fire falls from heaven and burns up all of his sheep and kills more of his servants. Um, what the Sabians don't get and the fire don't get, the Chaldeans come and steal and burn up. And then all of his kids are having a party in a house together, as was their custom. And the house falls down on them and they all die. And all of this happens at once. This is unbelievable tragedy, right? Unbelievable. Um, and one day, Job lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. He lost the whole life that he had built up to this point. We have to assume he was probably at least 50 years old to have 10 grown children, right? Probably older than that. And he's, he's, his whole life he'd built up. Um, you cannot imagine the pain that Job was going through. And so how does Job handle it? Look at verse 20. It says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. So Job has got the worst day of his life. The worst day of his life. And how does, he, how does he respond? He worships. He worships. Um, you know, that's a pretty good way to handle it when life gives you terrible things. I had a pretty rough night Sunday, and I had a pretty rough day Monday. And uh, one of the things that I did was I put on some headphones, and I have a favorite uh, album of just people singing hymns, and I just walked around the neighborhood and listened to hymns and worship the Lord a little bit. When you're going through a hard time, um, God is still good. God is still in control. He is still worthy of your worship. And worshiping the Lord, taking your eyes off of yourself, putting your eyes on the Lord when you're going through a hard time, um, can really help you. It can really help you get through the, through the hard times. It is always appropriate to worship the Lord. Always. There's never a time where it's not appropriate to worship God. So in chapter 2, Satan comes back to God. Um, Satan has failed his little test. Job is still righteous, and God points this out. And so Satan basically says, you know what? You told me I couldn't touch his body. Let me touch his body, and I know he'll curse you to your face. Right? And God says, okay, you can touch his body, but save his life. And so again, God is in control of Satan. And Satan smites Job with boils. These would be like big seeping blisters all over his body. Job has to take a, a potsherd, which is just a piece of broken pottery, and scrape himself to get some relief from these blisters. That sounds like a good time, doesn't it? <laughs> and Job's wife, I mean, up to this point, she's, she's probably a godly woman, but she's had enough. Sometimes people just have enough. And Job's wife has had enough. And she says, honey, you know, just give it up. Curse God and die. And again, Job keeps his wits. Look at verse 10 of chapter 2. But he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did Job sin, or did not Job sin with his lips. Okay? So, this is the prologue of the book. Now we enter into the body of the book. Okay, the, the vast majority of this book is Job's three friends come. And they are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And these, these men probably like, are, are a lot like Job. They're probably rich men that have some degree of godliness. Right? They're not, these are not wicked heathen men. These are probably rich men that have some degree of godliness. And they're looking at what has become of Job and how he's lost everything and how miserable he is and the pain that he's in and how his own wife has turned against him. And it's a lot for them to take in. Have you ever experienced one of your good friends going through something 
And it's sometimes it's a lot, right? It's just to, just to be with people as they're dealing with pain and dealing with hardship. These friends, I would say they start off as good, pretty good friends. They sit with Job for a week and don't say anything. They just sit with him for a week and they don't say anything. Listen, if you have three friends that will sit with you in your pain for a week and just be there with you, you're doing pretty good, right? And these guys did that. They sit with him for a week, but after a week, they open their mouth and they start philosophizing. And they want to get to the bottom of why Job is going through this trial. And so you have 35 chapters of them trying to convince Job of various reasons why he's going through this trial. And all of them is some form of this. You know, you must have sinned. That's really the, the argument. There must be sin here. God must be punishing you. You must be sinned. You must have sinned or God wouldn't do this to you. There's 35 chapters of three guys. Later, there's a fourth guy that joins them. And they're all spinning their theories about how Job had sinned and deserved the punishment of God. And Job defends himself. You know, uh, Job struggles, um, but mostly it's these four friends and a little bit of Job pontificating about Job's sorrow. And here's the point, okay? This is the point you have to understand about the book of Job. None of them, not the four friends and not Job, None of them have a clue. None of them have a clue. None of them know why Job is going through what Job is going through. You know, we have the advantage of reading chapter 1 and chapter 2. We have the advantage of seeing what happened in heaven. But you know who doesn't have that advantage in this story? Job didn't have it, and his friends didn't have it. Okay? Job never got the information that we read in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, you know, we know what happens at the end of the book. We know Job's going to have 10 more children. We know he's going to be even more rich. He's going to live a long and prosperous life. He's going to live 140 more years in health and prosperity. But he doesn't know that. And the point of the book of Job is that no one in the story has a clue. We know about God and Satan. Job didn't. His friends didn't. We know about God's eventual rewards, but Job didn't. His friends didn't. And that's the point of the story. That's the point of the book. Okay? They were arguing in the dark. They were philosophizing with insufficient data. They were making assumptions, and they were all wrong. They assumed they knew what God was doing, and they were way off. They had no clue. Okay? I want you to listen to me. Listen very carefully to this, okay? Be very careful. Be very, very careful telling somebody that you know why they are going through what they're going through. Okay? You don't. You might think you do, but you don't. Be very careful about assuming that someone's pain is the result of their sin or the consequence of something because you don't know. You don't know. You're, you're like Job's friends. You know, we were, we're not there in chapter 1. We don't see God having a talk with the devil. We are missing a huge piece of context, just like Job was missing a huge piece of context. It's like the story in John 9 where the disciples come to this man who's born blind and they ask, who did sin, this man or his parents? What's the assumption? That, you know, somebody sinned here. Somebody sinned here to cause this man's blindness, his pain. And what did Jesus say? John 9, 3. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. You know, Jesus said that God is doing something with this man and you don't know. You're wrong about it. Okay? Disciples, you're wrong. And that's what God gets to at the end of the book of Job. Uh, Job speaks, or God speaks to Job, uh, starting in chapter uh, 38, and he just says, 
Job, I'm going to ask you some questions, right? And I'll just kind of paraphrase some of these. You know, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I set up the seas? Where were you when I set up days and nights? Where were you? Uh, or, or do you know where the seas come from? Do you know where the spring of the seas is? All right? Have you seen, Job, the gates of death and came back to talk about it? And God just, that, that's just a small, a small sampling of the questions. God asked Job these questions for chapters and chapters. Okay? And the point is always the same. The point that God was making to Job is this, I know stuff that you don't know. Who are you to question me? Who are you to try to figure it all out? All right? I'm God and you're not. That's the point. Um, you don't know the whole story. And you're not meant to know the whole story. And finally, in the last chapter, Job repents. Um, verse 6 of chapter 42, he says, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Um, Job got the message. I'm not God. Uh, I just have to trust God. I don't have to understand everything God is doing. And then God deals with Job's buddies in the last part of the chapter here. Uh, God tells them they're wrong, and they need to, to go offer some sacrifices, and I love them. I uh, love this. He says, you need to have Job pray for you. He's the righteous one here. You need to have him pray for you. Okay? Um, Job wasn't wicked. He was righteous. It was just God doing something. God was up to something that none of them could see. God restores Job at the end of the chapter. He gets back everything he lost plus some. He lives another 140 years after the trial in blessing. He gets to see his great, 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 great grandchildren, right? He's a blessed man. That's how the story ends. All right, verse 17. So Job died being old and full of days. God restores Job. So what does it mean? What, what, are the, uh, what are the points for us? What are the applications for us? I'm going to give you three points uh, from this story, okay? Um, the first thing is this. Number one, do not presume to know what God is doing in trials. Do not presume to know that God is do what God is doing in trials. This is the biggest takeaway, I, I think, from this book. At no point in this story... Did Job or his friends really know what was going on? They thought they knew. They were very sure they knew, but they were wrong. God was doing something bigger. God was working out his own thing, his own purpose, and it really had nothing to do with them. All right? J. Sidler Baxter put it this way. Uh, he said, between the prologue, that's chapters 1 and 2, and the epilogue, chapter 42, we have a group of patriarchal wiseacres theorizing and dogmatizing from incomplete premises and deficient data. Put that in plain English for you. They had no idea what they were talking about. All right? They were certain. They were so certain. All right? They were dogmatic about it. Every one of them was dogmatic about it. They were certain they knew what was up. And they didn't have a clue. You know, be careful when you say that person's sick because they're probably not tithing. Or, uh, you know, that, uh, that person, his son went into sin because of something that he did years ago. All right? Anything like that, just, just stop your mouth. Just don't say it. You don't know. You don't know what God is doing. You can't know. All right? Uh, not with your trials or other people's trials. Don't presume that you know for certain what God is doing. Okay, that's the first takeaway. Second takeaway is this. God doesn't need you to have it all figured out. God needs you to trust him in it. God doesn't need you to have it all figured out. God needs you to trust him in it. Uh, Alfred Edersheim said this. He said, we cannot understand the meaning of many trials. God does not explain them. To explain a trial would be to destroy its object, which is that of calling forth simple faith and implicit obedience. 
If we know why the Lord sent this or that trial, it would be thereby cease to be a trial either of faith or patience. What does he mean? He means that you don't get to understand what God is doing in a trial. If you understood, it would stop being a trial. If you understood, you'd be living by, by sight and not living by faith. If you understood, uh, you wouldn't have to use faith. You wouldn't have to build up your patience, build up your endurance. You wouldn't have to trust God and just worship him for who he is in the midst of it. God doesn't need you to have it all figured out. God doesn't need you to figure out what's, what's going on in your life. God needs you to trust and obey him in the middle of it. Okay? Um, think about, about Job's life like a terrible traffic jam. Bumper to bumper, as we'd say in New Hampshire or New England, bumper to bumper, all right? A bumper to bumper car jam, all right? Um, imagine a terrible traffic jam. Just, you can't move, and it goes on for miles, and you're stuck in the middle of it, and every five minutes you get to move an inch, right? And you can't see anything. You see your steering wheel, and you can look out ahead of you, and you can see maybe 100 yards of cars, and maybe you see cars over there, and you see cars behind you as far as the eye can see, and you're just stuck in the middle of it, right? You get a pretty limited view of things. But there's somebody up in a helicopter, the traffic guy, zooming over the city, and he sees the whole thing. He sees where it starts, he sees the, the, what caused it. He sees where it's, where it's going to be over, how far back it goes. But you, with your steering wheel, you don't get to see any of that. Job does not get the helicopter view of his trials. He only ever gets the steering wheel view of his trials. And his job is to trust God and steer the car according to God's instructions. And it's the same thing with us. This is the way all of our trials work. You're going to have trials, okay? You might be having a trial right now, and your temptation is going to be to say, God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? You know, that's not a bad question. Uh, David asked similar questions all through the book of Psalms. But listen, it is a question that God is not obligated to answer for you. God is not obligated to show you his view of things. God gives you himself. God gives you his word. And that is enough to steer the car through whatever traffic jam that God puts you in in life. That is enough to steer the car. Okay? Do what's right. Worship me. Lead your family. Study the scripture. Live by it. Let me figure out the why. So, Job had it right at the beginning of the book. He should have just kept on worshiping God. He got back to that at the end. So, third takeaway. Number one, don't presume to know what God is doing in trials. Man, I'm flying tonight. I'm almost done. Number two, God doesn't need you to have it figured out. God needs you to trust him through it. Number three, here's the third thing, and... The last thing, so maybe I can stretch this out for 10 minutes. In every trial, you can be confident that a good God is in control. In every trial, you can be confident that a good God is in control. Job did not get to see the throne room conversation between God and Satan. But we do. By God's grace, we get to see that side of this story. And that teaches them, so, us something about the trials that we go through, okay? First, we learn that God is in control. Satan cannot do anything without God's permission. You know, I, I remember being a kid, and there was this uh, period, I think, in the 90s, or it was definitely in the 90s, um, where uh, there was like a big Satanism scare. Just lots of talk about Satan. And it's appropriate to talk about Satan. Satan is real, right? He's a roaring, uh, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But there was all this talk about Satan and Satanism and, and uh, demon possession. People used to talk about that stuff, it seems like, a lot. And I remember 
being terrified of demons and terrified that, you know, like I would go door knocking and I'd be like, oh, I wonder if there's demons in here. Okay? Here's the truth. God is in complete control of the demons. God is in complete control of Satan. And God will not allow any of them to touch you unless it's part of his plan. God is in control. All of the terrible things that happened to Job, God had to sign off on them. Um, and whatever evil befalls you, God uh, may not be behind it. God might not be the mind behind it, but ultimately he is allowing it as a part of his good plan. So we learn that God is in control. Second, we can look at the throne room. We can see from this that God is not just in control. God knows what's going to happen. How many of you think that God is smart enough, he's not going to make a wager, if you will, with Satan, that he isn't going to win? Uh, God knows the end from the beginning, and he knew what Job would do. God knew the end of this story, and God knows the end of our story. God knows the end of our trial. He, he knows everything. So he's in control. He knows the end from the beginning. Number, thir number three, number third, number third. I used to have a teacher in college, and he'd be like, letter three, number C. And he didn't do it on purpose. It was just like funny. All right, anyways. <clears throat> Third, we can look at this, and we can learn that God had a good purpose. What was God's purpose in Job's suffering? How many understand that this book of Job properly understood, has helped believers through suffering for probably 5,000 years now. Countless people have been helped through suffering, through the lessons they learned from this book, okay? God used Job's pain uh, not just to make a point to Satan, but to make a point to millions of believers that have read this book, and it's helped them. So, God had a good purpose. And finally, you can look at this story and you can see that God had a good end for Job. He was working this out for good. You know, Job didn't know about chapter 42 until chapter 42 happened, but God did. And listen, if you're going through a trial, if you're going through hardship, you can count it all joy. Not because the trial itself is a joy, okay? Okay. Uh, Brother Evan screwed into his hand the other day. That's not a joy. The only like, yes, emergency room. And nobody does that, all right? You can count it a joy, not because the trial is a joy, um, but because a good, sovereign, all-powerful God is behind it, working out a good purpose and a good end. You've all heard this illustration before, right? Um, not, mon not many of us like straight cocoa powder. Anybody just like spoon cocoa powder out of the, uh, out of the Hershey's container? If you do, that's weird, all right? N not many of us like flour. Not, not many of us like raw eggs or baking powder, right? Um, we don't drink uh, pure vegetable oil. I hope not. Right? All those things by themselves are bitter ingredients, but you uh, put them in a mix with some sugar and you put it in the oven 350 for a while, you're going to have some pretty good brownies, right? And how many you like brownies? I hope you like brownies. I love brownies. The point is this. God promises that he's going to work all things for, together for good, but that doesn't mean that everything that we deal with is going to be pleasant. God takes the bitter ingredients of our life and we can trust him that he is using them for his good, for his purpose, that he's in control. I'm going to close by, uh, by reading a line from an old hymn. Um, William Cowper was an interesting guy. He was this genius poet um, who was also insane, like literally insane. Um, and uh, he uh, loved the Lord but he struggled with depression and insanity for much of his life. 
And he didn't get kind of any kind of settledness until he met his pastor, who was John Newton. And together, John Newton and William Cowper were used of God to write many hymns. All right, they they put together like the first hymn book uh, in English. And um, John uh, William Cowper is the guy that wrote, "There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins." Right, beautiful, beautiful hymn writer. Um, but Cowper wrote this. This uh, stanza in the hymn, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. And I want you to think about this. Deep and unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I like that last phrase. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Whatever trial that you're going through, whatever frowning providence that life throws at you, as a believer that knows who God is, you can be sure that behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. As bad as it might seem, God is still good. God is still in control. God is working out this thing for his good, for his purpose. You just have to trust him in it and worship him in it. All right? That is our, um, our lesson for tonight. All right? Uh, I'm going to pray. Brother Adam will come and do a, a prayer request. I want to say something afterwards. So, Brother Adam, if you'll just give me time when you're done there. All right? But lead us in prayer, if you will.